We think that because violence is undesirable, to study it is to endorse it, to say that we think it is desirable. 99 times out of 100, the answer will not be violence. It will be avoidance or de-escalation. But that one time when violence is the answer, make no mistake, it will be the only answer. My message is a simple one. To avoid being a victim of violence, you need to learn from it. Hello everyone, this is War Is My Business, and today we will be going over the book When Violence Is The Answer, Learning How To Do What It Takes When Your Life Is At Stake by Tim Larkin. Violence is a tool. One of the first premises that the author puts forth is the need for people to dissociate any preconceived notions that violence is inherently bad. The study of violence, therefore, is also not inherently bad, and it would be in everyone's best interests to learn the nature and use of violence so that, at the very least, they can protect themselves against it. Violence is a tool like any other. As with any other tool, the proper object of our moral and ethical judgment isn't the what. After all, you wouldn't call a screwdriver or a toothbrush evil, but rather the why, the ends to which human beings choose to direct it. Indeed, people we may view as evil can use the tool of violence in immoral ways for their own ends. For those that want to shape the world first need to shape society around them, and for many, it is much harder to shape people's perspectives than it would be to simply remove them altogether. Those that may utilize violence in an evil way can destroy their adversaries through its use and avoid the hard work of persuasion in winning hearts and minds. But remember, some of the most common responses to the illegal or immoral use of violence is the justified and morally acceptable use of violence. Osama bin Laden, Adolf Hitler, and Dong Zhou, depending on perspectives, used violence immorally but then had violence brought against them. If violence is brought upon you, would you not be justified to defend yourself with the tool of violence? Especially if their intent is to hurt and kill you, then your only real options might be to fight back or die. So, Larkin looks at violence as a tool in the pragmatic sense and not so much in the moral sense. Meaning that in the process of learning violence, he isn't as concerned about who was justified in the use of violence and only in who was more effective in its use. Therefore, he is as apt to learn from criminal use of violence as he would from a police officer or innocent bystander. In many parts of his book, he talks about doing video analysis of prison inmates on how to train to protect themselves and fight other inmates and prison guards. Larkin's view of violence, as you will see if you read his book, is very utilitarian. It is just a tool, and if you want to defeat it, you must learn about it. Social versus AE social violence and de-escalation. Larkin speaks about two forms of violence we see within society. Social violence is about social position. It follows the rules and involves a lot of posturing. Schoolyard fights, road rage, and disrespectful attitudes, for example, can lead to arguments that compel them to fight to assert their position. They are quasi-violent scenarios that stem from conflict and jockeying within the social hierarchy. Making the other submit is a primary goal of social violence, to assert dominance and their will over others. A social violence is about wrecking the social order, killing and damaging a target to take what you need. This is the bully victim, who, rather than fighting back, a form of social violence, brings a gun to school and blasts them all away. This is the mugger who, rather than hold you up at gunpoint demanding your wallet, another form of social violence, shoots you in the back of the head and takes your stuff. In a social violence, the victim is simply in the way and not someone the attacker is trying to influence. Most confrontations are of the social nature, but you really never know what the other person is thinking. You may feel the need to confront a person who insulted you and assert your dominance, or you may see that they broke the law and you are going to call them out on it. But what if the other person is intoxicated, has a warrant for their arrest, or is merely a person with sociopathic tendencies? You may be looking for a social fight at the very most, but they might be willing, pressured, or even eager to escalate it to an asocial fight. You wanted to posture and teach them a lesson, but they rushed you with the intent to harm or kill. Because of this, Larkin suggests de-escalating social confrontations when possible. You may be justified in your actions, but since you never know what the other will do, it is better not to escalate the situation yourself, even at the expense of your own ego or immediate benefit. And even for those of us who are best prepared, who are able to fight for our lives and win, 
there's something far better, never having to fight for our lives at all. Attacker Mindset The author warns of the defensive mindset that victims have in AE social confrontations. They think about how to protect themselves, how to disengage, and how to ultimately make it out alive. They react to the attacker instead of simply acting themselves. The attacker has the advantage since they take the initiative. Defenders are only focused on injuring. If you're thinking about what your attacker might do, or why he has picked you, then your brain's focus shifts toward the defensive, reactive posture of a victim responding to someone else's aggression, and it puts you way behind the power curve. When you lapse into a defensive mindset like that, you're automatically at a disadvantage, because reacting is always slower than acting. In order to regain the edge in a fight, and avoid having to be reactionary, you must maintain the mindset of an attacker, forcing your adversary to react to your action instead of the other way around. By this time, you should realize that violence is merely a tool and that your adversary seeks to bring it upon you. Therefore, you bring it upon them first and continue to keep the pressure on them, never letting up and giving them a chance to act, only react. This will ensure that you improve your chances for survival, and if you can cause the first injury, then your chances of successfully defeating them increase. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Larkin harkens back to the old military adage that training in the fundamentals slowly, ensuring that your form is proper and effective, will ensure that you can actually perform that task effectively when the time comes. Drilling those body positions, how you deliver strikes and throws, and how you transition from one target on the body to the next will strengthen those respective neural pathways in the brain, something we discussed in detail in our section on the human domain. Since actual combat can be hectic and confusing, and you may not have the time to think clearly, you must rely on what you have drilled into your brain. If you drill in proper form, then when you execute, you will be ineffective. When it comes to self-defense, I found that this crucial aspect of training is missing from nearly everyone's curriculum, and to me, that's a huge mistake. Slowness, deliberateness, Mastery of fundamentals, they're the foundation on which everything else is built. Without form, force and accuracy, you won't generate the effect you want. He brings up that speed and strength in training aren't as important. What is much more important is the conditioning necessary to identify important targets on the body to strike and the requisite form necessary to deliver a debilitating injury upon them. As long as you have the proper form to do it, you can do it quickly and with the force needed to do the job when the adrenaline starts rushing. What you can't do is think through potential attacking points and make assessments after each hit. You need to be able to assess the situation and immediately recall viable maneuvers to defeat the foe, regardless of the predicament. The Science of Injury In the last major chapter of the book, Chapter 9, Training to Inflict Injury, the author describes the methods for producing the injuries that will incapacitate your adversary. Through the use of strikes, joint breaks, and throws, focusing on targeting parts of their body, you find his discussion on the specific angles required to break joints, tendons, and ligaments. I don't want to dig too deep into the techniques, but I want to discuss his references to fundamental sciences. This is because the way he brings it up is similar to how we discuss the sciences in relation to war and business, breaking complex social endeavors down to causal relations with the natural world. In the discussion of the striking, he notes that the purpose of the strike is to produce kinetic energy that is imparted into the target area in order to cause damage, break bones, dislocate joints, cause concussions, etc. He also notes that the capacity of the muscles to deliver enough energy to do the necessary damage to cause injury is also sometimes insufficient. He therefore adds to the power of the strike the motion of the body. You'll need to recruit the largest amount of kinetic energy you can access your body weight in motion. Without that powder charge of body weight in motion, you end up throwing bullets at him instead of shooting them. Your body stores potential energy, that is, energy that is potentially kinetic, in two forms, in chemical bonds inside your muscles and in the elevation of your mass in Earth's gravitational field. You can convert this potential energy to kinetic energy in two ways, using your muscles to accelerate your mass or lowering your mass in the gravitational field. This helps to explain how striking or throwing, which he amusedly refers to as striking the opponent with the earth itself, causes the damage you need to debilitate another person. 
It is a relationship between generating force in sufficient quantities to counter the resistance posed by the strength of bones and joints. With an emphasis on targeting specific points on the body, Larkin suggests we focus the energy we are able to produce on just those critical vulnerabilities. By focusing that energy, we can avoid wasting it on portions of the body that won't cause the effects we are looking to achieve. Debilitating injury. Business applications of when violence is the answer. Regarding the tool of violence, we don't employ that much in the business sector. It is a tool for the military, police, and security sectors. Still, Larkin's discussion of social and asocial violence is all about preparing for people to bring it to you, your people, and your customers. Understanding that there are people out there that will bring harm, regardless of what your business may be, you can take the appropriate measures. Some companies have security for added protection due to the nature of their business, banks, bars, and big retail stores. Indeed, the big companies can afford the additional security that can, at the very least, deter minor crimes like shoplifting and vandalism, but can also provide a deterrent or intervention force against threats that include robbery, social, or wanton killing, asocial. They also have the additional infrastructure that allows them to communicate with emergency services more effectively than small businesses, and as a result, first responders can arrive much sooner. In the case of small businesses, capital is limited, and the ability to pay for the additional physical and IT security may be out of the question. However, management still needs to think about the potential of violence coming their way. To protect their employees and customers, and to protect their assets from social and asocial violence, they need to have a plan to mitigate threats. In the case of social aggression, you may have options. For disgruntled customers, who may be making a scene, there is no need to escalate unless they do it themselves. De-escalating the situation and removing them from everyone else is probably the best course of action. Sometimes that may include simply agreeing to their terms in order to get them out of there, if practical. In the case of a social danger, you have fewer options, fight or run. If you run, you may survive, but others may not. If you fight, you may die, but others may live. We may not know who may be killed and who will survive in a moment such a violent encounter occurs, but we know that it will be determined by those most willing and effective in the tool of violence. The tool of violence doesn't care who's in the right when it gets picked up. It only cares who swings it best. As a small business owner, you may have to come to the realization that violence can come to you and your people regardless of your business. What will you do and what are your employees prepared to do in the face of senseless killing? Whether or not you intend to train in the way Larkin provides, you must still have a plan and train in that. You must consider how to mitigate the danger and train everyone involved in its implementation. This could include the installation of bullet-resistant windows and improved surveillance systems as an overt display, even personal defense weapons hidden but easily accessible, and evacuation plans in case of active shooters. Conclusion Tim Larkin's book, When Violence is the Answer, Learning How to Do What It Takes, When Your Life is at Stake, makes a few points that the author wants the reader to remember, and you will pick up as you read through his book. Understand, violence is just a tool, neither good nor bad. Social violence can be de-escalated. A social violence requires you to fight to survive. Your survival is first predicated on recognizing whether a potential fight is social or asocial. When fighting, attackers have the advantage. You must adopt the attacker mindset, even if you are in the right. You must attack to injure. Keep injuring until the adversary is incapacitated or killed. When training, slow down and focus on form. Focus on targeting critical areas of the body. Practice shifting blows on different targets when they are open. Focus on attacking through the target for optimal force. While this review doesn't comprehensively cover all the principles that Larkin writes about, I hope it provides you an understanding of what to expect, only in greater detail, especially in regards to how to cause injury and effective places to target on the human body was not discussed here. I would highly advise picking this up if you want to know the nature of violence, enjoy many interesting and thought-provoking anecdotes, or if you simply enjoy life and would like to keep living it when faced with a person intent on taking it. If this book interests you and you would also like to support War Is My Business, please consider purchasing the author's book from the link in the description. Please hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already, and thanks for watching.